And that takes us very nicely to our third storyteller for today. And um, permit me, the story I'm about to tell about him is, is a bit lengthy, but please pay close attention to what I'm about to introduce you to. I dare say it is a very, very impressive story, and we look forward to hearing him tell us about his perspective on wielding power this afternoon. Our third storyteller... Mr. Kola Tubosun was born in Ibadan, Nigeria, on September of 1981. There's something about Ibadan this afternoon, isn't there? He holds a master's in linguistics from Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, 2012, and a BA from the University of Ibadan, 2005. He also studied briefly at Moa University, Eldoret, Kenya, in April 2005 as part of a Mikasa Foundation-sponsored social cultural exchange program. At the University of Ibadan, he was a campus journalist and rose to the position of president of the Union of Campus Journalists, which he led from 2002 to 2004. In 2009, he was a Fulbright scholar, and he taught Yoruba at Southern Illinois University, Edwardsville, until 2010. His debut collection of poetry, Travel Log, Edwardsville by Heart, covers this period. In 2010, while still in the US, he worked as a volunteer adult literacy tutor with resettled immigrants and at the International Institute of St. Louis, Missouri in Missouri. In 2012, he completed a master's in linguistics, TSL, and returned to Lagos, Nigeria to take up a job as a high school teacher of English language. For a few years between 2015 and 2019, he worked as a linguist at Google Nigeria, first as a speech linguistics project manager from 2015 to 2016, and later as a project manager for natural language processing tasks in African languages in 2019. His work of advocacy has focused on the role of African languages in today's world, especially in technology, education, literature, governance, and entertainment. He founded the Yoruba Names Project in 2015, a lexicography project to show how technology can help in revitalizing local languages. As a writer, he has produced work in travel writing, travel poetry, essays on literature, scholarly writings, journalism, and fiction. From September 2019 to September 2020, he was a Chevenian Fellow at the British Library in London as a research fellow on the library's African language printed collection from the 19th century. In September 2020, he was appointed Program Director of Yoruba Academy in Ibadan. Tubosun is known for his work in linguistics, technology, and language advocacy. He has written extensively on the need to empower Nigerian languages and Nigerian English to function effectively in education, technology, governance, and literature. He has also engaged in projects in furtherance of these objectives. In 2012, he led a successful campaign to have Twitter include Yoruba, his mother tongue in the list of languages into which the platform was being translated. So if you ever have to tweet in Yoruba, you know the man to thank. In March 2015, he founded the Yoruba Names Project at yorubaname.com as an effort to document all names in Yoruba in an accessible multimedia format. The project also released a free Yoruba keyboard software for Mac and Windows to allow its users to type in Yoruba language and Igbo on the internet. Again, whenever you type on your Mac or your computer in Yoruba language, you know who to thank. Tubosun's team at Google Nigeria was behind the Nigerian English voice accent on Google platforms. The voice was launched in July 2019. His collaboration, that word again, at Google was helpful in getting Nigerian language DAC critics into Gboard and also correcting the mistranslation of the issue, the Yoruba trickster god on Google Translate. He has also worked with Google Art and Culture on some of its exhibits in Nigeria and Kenya. He has worked as a consultant for Oxford English Dictionary since 2018 on Nigerian English and Yoruba entries. Some new words from Nigerian English were added to the Oxford English Dictionary in December 2019. 
He collaborated in 2017 with Orisha Image to create Yoruba Melody, a multilingual 90 minutes free Yoruba language audio phrase book for Olorisha and cultural tourists. The audio phrase book was released in English, Spanish, and Portuguese. In August 2019, a fourth language was added, German. He has worked with BBC Academy to help localize the journalistic style guide of the BBC into Igbo, Yoruba, and Nigerian Pidgin, ahead of its maiden broadcast in those Nigerian languages. In honor of UNESCO's declaration of 2019 as the International Year of Indigenous Languages, he, through the Yoruba Name Project, in collaboration with Rising Voices, created at DG African Lang, a Twitter rotation curation account featuring scholars and professionals working in African language documentation and revitalization across the continent. With such an impressive introduction, I'm sure you're looking forward to the next few minutes as we listen to our third storyteller for this afternoon. Distinguished ladies and gentlemen, please let's make very welcome Mr. Kola Tubosum. Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone. <sighs> no pressure. Um, I'm very happy to be here. Thank you, Isaac, for inviting me. Um, um, I'm very excited to share a few, a few ideas, a few thoughts, and some stories about my journey uh, and my experience in advocating for languages in Nigeria. Um, and my own um, successes and ups and downs in this field. Give me a second here, let me open the... Okay, before I go into the, um, the presentation, I'm going to give you a, just a, a small story uh, that I remember a lot, um, which happened when I was about eight or seven in Ibadan, where I grew up. Um, and it was um, a day my father came to school to, to visit us in class. And I went to a private um, primary school. And as we often do when um, visitors came to school, we would stand up and say, good morning, it's a uh, good morning, ma. And, the, you know, and then sit down, and then the parents would go to meet the teacher. But my father came, and... We all stood up, as usual, and said, good morning, sir. And he looked at everyone, theatrically, um, pretended to be confused about what was happening, and said to everyone, which means in um, English, I, I don't speak English. Um, of course, he did, and I knew that. But at that moment, I was totally embarrassed um, for a reason I didn't understand for until much later, that my father would come to school and embarrass me in front of my mates by saying that he didn't understand English. And then everybody recovered and they said, a carosa, because many of us spoke Yoruba as well. And they said, hey, and then we sat down and he, he did his business. But I remember this, um, you know, over the years, um, and he doesn't remember when I mentioned to him, as one of the first instances where I, I encountered the, um, the language attitude that I had imbibed as a student and as a child living in uh, Akubo in Ibadan in the 80s. Um, and I wondered and questioned myself for, for the years, why was I embarrassed that my father said he couldn't speak in English in uh, a Yoruba town in Nigeria in, you know, in the uh, late 80s. Uh, and what I found out, of course, was that the reason was we had imbibed this attitude, and the school had also um, beaten it into us, sometimes literally, um, that the languages we spoke were not um, valid or were not important enough and that if you don't speak English, you're not smart, or you're not educated, or you're not important. Um, when we spoke Yoruba occasionally in school, you get punished, or sometimes you paid a fine. Um, and some of your mates were also empowered to report to you, oh, this person speaking vernacular, as we called it at the time. Um, but at home, we spoke Yoruba. He spoke Yoruba to us. My mother spoke Yoruba uh, at home. When we went to school, we spoke in English. Uh, my father, who was also a writer, a Yoruba writer, and scholar, and broadcaster, gave us books in both languages. So we read in Yoruba and we read in English. Um, 
so I knew that, I mean, he's, he'd gone to school, he's, he, I knew that he's, he, he spoke in English, but the idea that publicly he would acknowledge that he couldn't speak in English in front of my mates, you know, but bothered me for a long time. It was when I grew up that I finally realized that um, what he was doing was um, giving us a chance to understand that uh, the languages we spoke at home and elsewhere were equally as valid as the ones we spoke in school. And the, the environment we had at home, the upbringing we had, uh, gave me a chance to um, become competent in the languages we spoke at home, Yoruba, um, and the one we eventually spoke outside. When I grew up or became an adult, I figured out, I realized that many of my mates who grew up around the same time did not have the same upbringing um, or imbibe the same attitude that you know, our languages were not as important as uh, English language. And um, as an adult, you know, going up in the world, I realized that I had I become more competent in my language, um, perhaps better than many of the other mates that I grew up with. There would be words that they would say, oh, what's the meaning of this one? And I would know it. And they were like, how did you know, know that? You know? Um, this is, these are Yoruba, Yoruba expressions. And in you know, going to university and, and becoming an adult, I, I, I realized eventually that my parents had done something very important, which is to make me as confident in speaking my own language, Yoruba as speaking in English. And that informed many of the things I eventually went on to do, like you know, um, work, at, work at Google or you know, be interested in languages. Even though, even though I went to the university to study linguistics, it was not the first choice I'd gone for communication arts. But when I got to linguistics, which was the choice I was given, I realized in the first semester that that was exactly where I wanted to be. And I, you know, all the experience I'd had um, combined with the environment I went into to, to see that Nigerian languages had started to become less important in society, um, or the attitude had changed in such a way that people thought that when you spoke a Nigerian language, you were not educated, or when you made a mistake in English, it means you're not smart, um, or that when you spoke a language that your people around you didn't understand, um, that you were kind of, you know, um, you were a suspicious person. I'll give an example. When I used to teach in English at a high school in Lagos, and one of my colleagues, um, would always complain that you know, some of the teachers spoke Yoruba among themselves. Um, and I would say, well, what's the problem with that? Um, and he would say, well, it's a professional environment. Um, you know, why are they speaking Yoruba? And I would say, well, are they speaking Yoruba in this class to the students? He would say, no, well, they're speaking among themselves. Yeah, but students are seeing them speaking Yoruba. That's a problem. And I'd be like, OK, what if they were speaking French or Spanish? Would that be a problem? He said, well, no, because you know, he couldn't explain it. But the, the, the impression I got from that was that he valued foreign languages um, you know, um, more than Nigerian languages. So that's one way, one, one, one of the um, problems that I found. Um, so over the years, I have, I have dedicated myself to finding opportunities that exist in language and the power. I titled this Wielding the Power of Language. I may not need to go through all the slides, but I will let you know when to. Um, that the multi, uh, multilingual nature of Nigerian society is a very powerful asset that we have failed to tap into because of our suspicions of each other, uh, because of the colonial uh, carryovers and burdens we've you know, imbibed, and because of a number of you know, weird um, attitudes that you know, don't find justification in anything that's rational except our own fears. So um, a while ago, um, I was returning from a trip abroad. Uh, I wanted to go to the slide, um, this 13. And I took a picture of this. Many of you who are on Twitter may have seen this, um, that it bothered me that when you entered Nigeria, the only messages that um, welcomed you in the country were in English. And every other place I'd been to, either in Kenya or in Wales or in Korea, there were always more than one language welcoming you to the country. One, to show you that this country is a multilingual space and to showcase their own diversity, language diversity. Um, but Nigeria has over 500 languages and the only language that welcomes you to Nigeria is, 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 um, is uh, in English. And usually I've noticed this when I make statements that end up being controversial for some reason or the other uh, about language in Nigeria, that people have this impression that when you say that you don't want only English to represent us, that you are saying that um, you want only your own language, Yoruba, for instance. Um, or sometimes they say, well, how many of these 500 languages are we going to put on the, on the banner? Which is, in some ways, rational to ask. 
Um, but not enough, because the airport is a big space. You can put different welcome to Nigeria in different parts of the country, I mean, or of the airport space while you walk through, with art and designs and all of that. Um, move to the next slide and see what one person said. This is among one of the many responses I got. Um, dollar is at 500 plus. Is this what is worrying you? Um, of course, to say that, you know, see how many retreats he got. Could you move, move, move that a little bit? Yeah. To tell you that he got a number of people um, in showing interest in that kind of thinking. And what my response to this, of course, was, our multilingual, um, the nature of multilingual nature of Nigeria is actually an asset that could, even responding to this um, response, uh, bring the value of the Naira up. And I will give you a couple of examples. Um, and Angela Merkel, uh, the German Chancellor of Vladimir Putin, the President of Russia, you see them go to the United States uh, whenever they are interviewed by journalists, they speak in their language. They speak English very well, they understand English. But when, they, when the journalists talk to them, they respond in their language. And then the journalists, the TV um, stations will have to find uh, a translator to tell you what they're saying and they write it on the screen. Um, this is very little, but it provides a job for a Russian translator, for instance, who lives in those places, or a German translator who lives there. If a Nigerian president went abroad and decided to speak in Hausa, for instance. Now, Hausa is controversial because people hate Buhari, okay, I understand. But this argument I started it when Goodluck Jonathan was president, which is when you go abroad, speak Ijo, when you are responding to a foreign journalist, they will be forced to find an Ijo speaker who lives in that place and give him a job. and your work will be translated on the screen. Everybody says, ah, oh, wow, what, what is that about? Um, same thing with Abbasu Joe or you know, um, Buhari. It shows one, on one hand that we're a multilingual country. Um, the people there would understand when somebody translates it anyway. It's not like, I mean, what you're saying there, if you don't speak in English, they're going to think you're not educated. No, people come from different countries who speak different languages. People go on late night shows and speak their own language. Um, there. So this, are, this is one way of making money. This is one way of providing a job. This is one way of show, showcasing our multilingual nature of the country. And goes a long way to, I think, in my opinion, um, reduce the suspicions we have with ourselves when we hear someone speak a different language beside us and we start automatically suspecting that they are saying mean things or bad things about us. Um, so this is just you know, one of the things uh, I, that, that occupy me at night. Um, so. I, I mentioned, again, I, this is a photo I found uh, somewhere in Lekki. Many of you may have seen it. Lekki Free Trade Zone, and it's subtitled in Mandarin. Um, you would find this, people would find this more comfortable to look at without raising any eyebrow. But if it was in Yoruba or Igbo or Hausa, or three, three languages, you know, people would ask you random questions. Um, so why are we comfortable with more, more different languages from outside? Why? There are countries where if you don't have your product subtitled in the local language, your product will not be able to come in. Why don't we have that in Nigeria? That's another way to raise the Naira, for instance. Um, so there are instances of um, power relations that exist in language. And I think um, you know, opening our minds and being open to the different ways in which we can uh, look at our multilingual uh, environment uh, can benefit us Financially and also culturally, I, I, I mentioned um, working at uh, Google. The, uh, many of you might have come across the, the new language voice we released in 2017, which speaks in, Nigerian, in a Nigerian English accent, um, which now can pronounce uh, Lekki Express Expressway properly um, and can pronounce Bayokuku, et cetera. Um, that was a small but important step. Uh, the map before you know, used to model names of streets, and people just like, assumed that that was fine. Um, but there were Uber drivers who didn't go to school who wouldn't understand, who would miss their tons because um, they couldn't understand why the map was saying um, Ahose Adeogun Street instead of Ajose. Unfortunately, however, also when the Google Voice came out, many people started screaming, that, why is my Google Voice sounding like a Nigerian? I wanted it to sound like, you know, if I wanted to hear myself speak, I would, you know, uh, listen, look at the mirror and speak to myself. It was interesting, but a number of tweets also that came out in that direction. So. Um, Every day I go about, I, I'm, I'm looking at you know, instances in which you know, the multi, multilingual nature of Nigeria can be a benefit. Um, in my own work, it's helped me, um, you know, um, but also it's important um, as a way of both empowering us as a, as a nation that is coming up and uh, a nation in the world, but also as a way of uh, even personally um, empowering people to think of themselves as worthy and um, 
you know, worthy of dignity, worthy of, uh, you know, being able to live in the world in their, own, in their own language in the same way everybody else does in other spaces. I'll leave a last example. Um, ATM machines, for instance, in Nigeria, uh, for a long time, you couldn't even use a machine in any other language other than English. And that's assuming that everybody can speak the language. And yet, there are laws in Nigeria that says that, you know, um, I mean, or banks make rules that you would, they would prefer you go to the ATM machine instead of coming to the counter. And so, doing that, many people who don't speak in English, uh, you tell them to go put the money in the bank, and they can't get it out of the machine unless they uh, speak a language in which the machine is. You are also kind of excluding a number of people from the modern economy. Eventually, some ATMs, I think GTB or so, started adding uh, Yoruba Igbo Hausa um, as, as options, but that's also assuming that everybody who can speak those languages can also read them, which is also something uh, of an assumption. Um, even in English, um, there are a number of the English we write on the ATM machine, I was on the ATM one day and some guy was there for you know, minutes and I was impatient and eventually he asked for the, for the help he needed. And I found out what the, what the machine was telling him was that he could only withdraw in multiples of 100 or something like that. Um, which is, so someone who's gone to school, something that I could explain. But for him, who was just a businessman um, trying to get money out, he didn't understand what he was saying and I had to explain to him. So even when they were writing in English, we're not conscious of how we get the message across to the people. So to solve the problem of um, a machine that doesn't, that doesn't, is not familiar with the people who get to use it, what about um, having audio uh, as, as a means to, to access the machine? Having uh, text-to-speech and automatic speech recognition where people can actually talk to the machine like we have in other, other spaces in the language they're comfortable with and have the machine respond to them that way. Those are the things that people who work in tech um, might pay attention to and I have also worked in this space uh, myself. So in uh, conclusion, I think language is very important. Um, and I think there are great opportunities in language, in technology, in education, um, in governance. And um, Nigeria, as a, as a big country, you know, we haven't done enough to encourage and bring those lang uh, language diversity and the, and the value it has uh, to bear on our future developments. I think there's a lot of power in that. And I think it would be uh, important for us to wield it properly and use it to our own advantage. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Kola Tuboso. I'm tempted to say Eshe Kupo, Mr. Kola Tuboso, or Benny Kola Tuboso. We're going all the way. And you know, these are things that really and truly are important. And perhaps we don't take time out to think of the impact of these seemingly little things in our daily lives that make a huge impact, that have huge opportunities or huge influences and power where we stand.